Can Bitcoin be trusted? El Salvador wants to make it legal tender, but other countries are clamping down on cryptocurrencies, saying they provide a haven for criminals. So what's the future for digital money? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. It's just over a decade. Bitcoin has turned from an idea into one of the most talked about financial assets. Every day, more companies sign up to accept it as a form of payment. Fans say it's the future of money, free from the control of governments and central banks. The largest cryptocurrency conference in history took place last week in Miami. And it was here that El Salvador's president announced plans to make his country the first to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. 70% of the population don't have access to a bank account. Nayeb Bukele says his plan will help Salvadorians abroad, particularly in the United States, to send money back home. In the short term, this will generate jobs and help provide financial inclusion to thousands outside the formal economy. And in the medium and long term, we hope that this small decision can help us push humanity at least a tiny bit into the right direction. While some are embracing Bitcoin, it's a different story in China. The government has banned the cryptocurrency services in banks and it's blocked accounts promoting digital money on the microblogging site Weibo. One of the reasons may be the environment. China is home to 70% of the machines that handle or mine cryptocurrency transactions. It's estimated they use more energy per year than all of Argentina. Chinese state media has accused criminals of using virtual currencies to launder money and trade weapons and drugs. And in the US, the Justice Department announced it had recovered most of the bitcoins paid as ransom after hackers shut down oil pipelines last month. The equivalent of $4.4 million was sent to a group called Darkside, believed to be based in Russia. Today, we turned the tables on Darkside by going after the entire ecosystem that fuels ransomware and digital extortion attacks, including criminal proceeds in the form of digital currency, we will continue to use all of our tools and all of our resources to increase the cost and the consequences of ransomware attacks and other cyber-enabled attacks. Well, let's bring in our guests in Amsterdam, Thibaut Schreppel, who's an assistant professor in economic law at Utrecht University. In London, Dalaram Karawai, chair of cybersecurity in the Department of Computer Science at the University of York. And in New York, John Biggs, a journalist, entrepreneur and former editor of Coindesk, a site specialising in Bitcoin and digital currencies. Welcome to you all on the programme. John, can I begin with you in New York? Because in theory, an opportunity for the disenfranchised to be included in a process that will make it easier for them to receive money from abroad without the middlemen taking a huge cut. On the surface, it seems like quite a game changer for El Salvador. Sure, it absolutely does. Uh, I mean, the, the ultimate dream for a lot of uh, Bitcoin fans, cryptocurrency fans in general, was the ability to do remittances. Uh, remittances via cryptocurrency are essentially free. They're still associated fees, uh, but they're definitely not the 20 to 30 to even 50 percent fees associated with like a Western Union. Uh, those fees are just rapacious. So for El Salvador to uh, to accept Bitcoin as its own fiat currency, you could say, or just to sort of generally accept it in a uh, as legal tender is vitally important because I can basically sit here from my phone, wing you over five dollars, and not have to worry that I'm going to lose two fifty of that, two dollars and fifty cents of that uh, in transfer fees. Uh, that's a game changer for anybody who's making just a little bit of cash. Why do you think he's proposing it now? Uh, why are they proposing it now? The 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 answer to that is that it it was it was Bitcoin Miami. Uh, there was there was a conference going on, and it's just now becoming more mainstream to actually be able to pull this off. Uh, and it's actually probably easier and cheaper now than ever uh, to pull this off. So they might as well do it now. Let's go over to uh, Thibaut Schreppel in Amsterdam. I mean, while President. 
uh, Nayib Bukele has touted this idea, which likely will be ratified uh, by his government because he has the numbers over there in Parliament. How much of a move do you think this is to counter sort of US allegations at the moment of corruption and this widening rift between the US that wants to counter, you might say, any illicit financial dealings around the world to El Salvador trying to flex its muscle and, uh, on the surface, help its own people? Well, in, in my opinion, the U.S. is actually right in the middle. You do have one extreme, which would be to, to adopt cryptocurrencies as they exist already, which is the, the path that uh, El Salvador is taking right now. Another extreme is to ban cryptocurrencies, which uh, numerous countries, including Egypt, Morocco, Bolivia, and so on, are, are doing. And then in the middle, you have the U.S. and Europe, which are regulating existing cryptocurrencies, but also at the same time, they try to create their own cryptocurrencies to put a digital euro or a digital dollar. So it's not that extreme and that different from El Salvador in some respects. Uh, Delaram Karabai, can I bring you in from London? What's your opinion now? You've heard, you might say, two views, one from Amsterdam and one from New York. Uh, well, I work uh, mostly in the science uh, of, of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So my perspective is more towards the security and um, you know, how this could be secure and uh, how it can be legalized in many countries, for example, in US and Japan. I mean, can Bitcoin be, uh, be um, a security safe, you might say, in a country like El Salvador? We might not think of it as being, you might say, first world. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, some of the... Bitcoin companies, um, they have uh, they have their own uh, uh, security ways, and it's really hard to know um, what they are what they are using because of the IP or other regulations. But the point is that perhaps El Salvador wanted to um, uh, catch up and be in the same page as uh, other first world mm. countries, as I uh, mentioned. Uh, John, let's, can I come back to you in New York? I mean, can, can the US sure. put any pressure on El Salvador sort of to change their minds on using this Bitcoin currency? Because the move will allow perhaps El Salvador to move away from the normal banking systems, will it? Or it, 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 and, and potential sort of US oversight? Well, the, the, what, what, we're, what we're talking about here is the, is the, I guess, the digital equivalent of putting... Uh, filling a suitcase full of cash and sending it over a border, right? So it's a really, really interesting question that you're asking. Is it is it legal? Uh, does it have any effect on the uh, the fiat economy, I guess you could say? And I would argue that that in many cases, ex this is exactly this is exactly what a uh, a poor country should be doing. Uh, currency controls are damaging to a lot of countries. Uh, the, a lot of the fear associated with cryptocurrency isn't really a a big deal. You asked about security. Again, as I said, if you stick if you stick a bunch of cash in a box and send it to Grandma in in, uh, in El Salvador, uh, you're going to worry that somebody's going to intercept that and open it up. But the vast majority of time, it's almost impossible with cryptocurrency. Luckily, yeah. uh, that also means that once Grandma gets that cash, uh, she can be swindled out of it pretty easily because of because of online fraudsters, etc. Uh, the real question for El Salvador: How are they going to manage taxation of this? And one would suspect that at, at this point they don't have a good handle on that and in the future if they're able to use crypto uh, they may have a better handle on it especially mm. if they use some sort of centralized exchange uh, by breaking cryptocurrencies uh, cryptocurrencies are supposed to be implicitly decentralized right yeah um, there's not going to be supposed to be one actor by breaking them uh, and making one actor in that country uh, you could feasibly, you could feasibly make have more control over it. Okay. Well, Tibo's uh, nodding in agreement. I want to come to you actually over uh, in Amsterdam. I mean, how much, if we widen this conversation out now beyond El Salvador, how much uh, has the arrival and performance of Bitcoin made established banks and the banking system rethink the way that they have to operate now and in the future? Because ten years is a very short space of time to really change the face of the way finance is being rethought. I'm afraid we have to talk a bit about the technique and, and the infrastructure behind each cryptocurrency, uh, because you asked the question about security. Uh, to some degree, you could say that Bitcoin is very secured because uh, it is immutable. So if you send money, you know for a fact that money has been sent to that person. On the other end, if you want to stop transactions, then you could say that Bitcoin is probably not 
exactly what you want. And therefore, you may want to be looking for another type of cryptocurrency in which you do have only one actor behind it controlling all transactions. And I think this is what we're going to see when the state's going to develop their own cryptocurrencies. It will be public, meaning that everyone will be able to use it, but it will be permissioned, meaning that only the state or a handful of players will be able to uh, track all transactions and potentially stop a few transactions. So at the end of the day, the infrastructure behind blockchain and Bitcoin and all of those cryptocurrencies is very important. Of course, I mean, if you want to trust Bitcoin uh, as a currency, you have to buy into it as such. I mean, and that's where perhaps the problem lies for the sceptics, doesn't it, Thibaut? And that its success is for those that sort of want to take a chance on it. And it's all about trust. Yes, and I mean, that's a big debate because when Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever the person is, wrote the Bitcoin paper, he said that Bitcoin was a trustless uh, technology and, and currency. And some people are actually that, saying that it's actually the exact opposite. It allows you, because you don't have to trust a single person, to trust the entire system. But I very much agree with you. It's all a matter of trust at the end of the day. But the same is true for the dollar and euro. I mean, you trust that people will recognize the value if you use it for payments. So it's not that different at the end of the day in that regard. Indeed, I just want to give our viewers a little bit more uh, context. You talk about trust because, and as Thibaut said, there are different types of cryptocurrency. So let's have a quick look at them because the cryptocurrencies we've mentioned are virtual money uh, that are exchanged online. Cryptocurrencies derive their value from being scarce and are saved in a digital wallet. Now their value has fluctuated over the years. And despite the supporters say that they are safe havens that could one day replace gold. Then there's organizations like Facebook that have packed Deem, and it's another form of cryptocurrency. It's planning to launch a digital coin pegged to the US dollar later this year. And then there are governments who are looking at creating their own digital currencies. They're essentially electronic cash that could be used instead of banknotes, checks and credit cards. So let me go to uh, Dalaram uh, Karubai in London. Of course, it's all about trust uh, and, and the legality of cryptocurrencies being um, a, a form of money. I just want to give an example, <laughs> most probably for, for everybody at home uh, that can perhaps think of a, a simple example. Uh, trust a, a, and legal finances when you buy a house, for example. I may want to purchase a house in the UK. And when it comes to the bank asking me where my money comes from, they have to do due diligence, as does the lawyer who's organising the paperwork around the house. They want to see where the money has come from and how long it's been sitting in my bank before they can go ahead and said, yes, it's not part of money laundering or, or drug money. Uh, and that's where the problem lies, doesn't it, for Bitcoin, in, in that security aspect. Aspect, uh, Delaram, is, is that a problem in the way people can use Bitcoin and the security aspects around it? That's a great question. Um, one thing we have to pay attention is Bitcoin started uh, only in 2008. And usually what we consider in cryptography as something secure, it's um, a lot of cryptographers or mathematicians have to really study it and uh, do, do lots of research. So it's going to take some time, but inevitably, um, I think digital currencies are going to replace the classic currency as anything else. Uh, when we, many years ago, when we moved from uh, paperwork to everything computerized. So it's, it's certain. Um, about the verification and authentication, um, these are topics in uh, cryptography that has been uh, worked for a long time. And uh, the security around uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is not just uh, uh, trust and authentication. It's also how you can hack it or break it, which relies on um, security as so-called hash functions, which is still the existence of the real hash functions is a yeah. big open problem in, in the world. Okay. So the, the question about uh, how legal it is, it's um, I think mostly um, governments are uh, concerned about uh, the illegal way of um, using um, cryptocurrencies, for example, yeah. I don't know, drug dealers or terrorism or things like that. Sure. Um, Something that uh, even without digital currencies, this is uh, this is still going on and it's possible. It's just like they don't want to be surprised or uh, they found other ways to okay. do it. And also what I want to talk about taxation. Sure. Uh, Tiba, you're, you're nodding in agreement. Do you want to come in there? 
Sure, because I realize this might be confusing to, to, to some listeners because we hear sometimes that everything that happens on a blockchain is public. And sometimes we hear quite the opposite, that it's the dream for a criminal to do something in secret. And actually, the two are true at the same time. So to make it clear, what you see on the blockchain, and that is true for the Bitcoin blockchain, are, is the, the meta data. So you will see that one user is transacting with another user. That is public. But the reason for the transaction, the real life identity is not necessarily shown on the blockchain. And so for that reason, it might be if you can combine the data that as the regulator or the enforcer, you may get to the real life identity and to stop transaction. But at the same time, if you don't have enough information, then indeed, it, it might be that uh, Bitcoin is more secret than using your credit card to, to buy something in a store. And these are all the red flags that are being uh, flown at the moment, uh, John, uh, in New York. Um, uh, and recent events in China, certainly over the last, what, the weekend, have certainly made people who have Bitcoin um, alert, especially because a, a lot of the, actually, the mining, the collection of Bitcoin does happen in, in server areas across China. What's your reaction to what's mm -hmm. going on there? Uh, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a ploy by the Chinese government to reorganize the face of cryptocurrency. The, the Bitcoin mines are hugely energy in, uh, intensive, but the fact is they basically run them next to, a, next to a hydroelectric plant. So you're essentially getting free energy to run these things. Um, but it's making, it's making people who are essentially off the radar uh, fairly rich when it comes to that, when it comes to that technology. So that, that mission over there is to create a uh, more Earth-friendly uh, cryptocurrency that can be tracked in the same way that we were just talking about. I think one of the other issues that we have in terms of cryptocurrency is that we're waiting for the the governments are essentially trying to figure out a way to pave the pave the road towards general adoption. Mm. Uh, right now, you anyone on this call could probably grab some probably probably grab some ETH or some Bitcoin just by doing the things you need to do on a computer. Uh, but the vast majority of, uh, of people who would really, really need this technology wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, they might have not have the technology. They might not have the understanding. Uh, they might not even have the trust. So if, if well, I, I was, I was uh, working on a uh, remittance system a couple of years ago, 2014, I suppose. And the whole idea of remittances is based around the, you go to a place, you t sign a little piece of paper and you give your money over to a to clerk behind a bulletproof glass and you feel comfortable that that process is safe and secure. That's why you use a Western Union. That's why you use a money transfer station. Uh, this whole process is completely wild. It's completely alien, and it's and it's and it seems, on its surface, uh, implicitly dangerous. Uh, so that sort of education is vitally important now. Indeed, uh, and Delaron, can I bring you here about you know being implicitly dangerous and also uh, how difficult it is to track sometimes the transactions. What's happened in the U.S. over the colonial pipeline ransomware demands recently and the recovery of 4.4 uh, uh, half, maybe half of the 4.4 million paid in ransom certainly raises those red flags, doesn't it? I mean, how difficult is it to? Um, you might say, uh, track down those that are, you know, involved in criminal activity? What sort of expertise would the Americans have pulled in to try and get some of this Bitcoin back? Well, if, if you can uh, track and trace um, such uh, digital currencies, then um, it wouldn't uh, satisfy the, the actual need or the creation what remains to be answered is uh, there are many research around it, perhaps creating something new or adding additional um, parameters or, or, or something like that to the, to the whole um, uh, cryptography part of it to, to make sure that it will be adjusted to what governments are concerned of or um, perhaps prevent some of the uh, actions taken by or concerns about uh, the criminal aspect of it. In terms of uh, the criminality, uh, Tibu, I mean, the US seems to want to head off uh, Bitcoin uh, mining as such and, and, and most probably examples of, of what's happened uh, on their own territory alarms them when they're actually trying to tighten the rules for other countries. Sure. I mean, it seems to me that what you see very clearly is a race between some developers in the space. Not all of them want to escape you know, the state, but some do. 
and, and the states who are trying to catch up and to develop new technique. And so at the end of the day, it might be that if you are a big state, you may be able to you know, track down some, some case, uh, some usage. Uh, it might be more complex if you are an individual going after another Bitcoin user. Uh, so, so that's one thing that's happening in the field. And I very much agree that another very important topic is the one of access. And that's where big tech companies kick in. And we see and we discussed already, Facebook will launch a cryptocurrency in just a few weeks or months. And uh, it seems from the white paper that the plan is that if you download Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp on your phone, then automatically you will get the wallets that will allow you to use their cryptocurrency. Uh, so it, it, of course, it raises lots of questions, especially antitrust questions. But those are the two topics that I think we should be discussing and probably together. In, indeed, and uh, in terms of um, the, the way countries, uh, John Biggs in New York, like Egypt, Morocco, and potentially India banning uh, cryptocurrencies, do you think that is something that's just going to stay, you might say, for the short term? Because in the long term, they're going to have to, you might say, you know, join the party. Yeah, it's it's the short term. It's a short term solution. It's a uh, it's a solution born of. Uh you could say frustration uh, with the technology moving so fast. Not being, not understanding a technology is often the easy, is often the fastest road to banning it, unfortunately, uh, or understanding it too well, right? Understanding the uh, understanding the implications, especially for currency controls, and especially in a country where where maybe the outflow is bigger than the inflow, for example. Um, Trying to control that uh, those economics is wildly different, uh, difficult. Uh, it's and a lot of countries have given up, uh, which is why you see a slow but steady acceptance of cryptocurrency. Outright bans, uh, they never work, right? They're never, they're not gonna, they're not gonna remain. Uh, and I'm 100% certain that if if we went to Morocco right now, we'd be able to find some Bitcoin somewhere. Uh, in fact, I could carry this thing with me, which is a, uh, this is crazy little wallet. I could carry this into Morocco and buy and sell Bitcoin pretty easily. Indeed. I mean, Delaron, can I just bring you in here to talk about security? Because um, that is being called into question. Uh, and in the briefing notes I got before this program, you talk of quantum computers coming into effect and them having a, a very big influence on the whole business itself. Yes. Um... So in uh, 2015, the National Security Agency in the US, after Snowden's revelation, um, uh, made an announcement uh, followed by NIST, National Institute of um, um, Standard and Technology, made a, made a worldwide announcement for um, uh, getting proposals for so-called post-quantum uh, primitives or um, crypto systems that are basically secure against, um, uh, you know, if the if a strong quantum computer will be will be invented. And uh, last July, the third round uh, happened, and they um, announced the finalists uh, of the um, of the competition um, that are included in lattice-based cryptography and code-based cryptography, multivariate. Uh, cryptography. And uh, so um, Bitcoins or cryptocurrencies are somehow um, should be, um, you know, I, I kept mentioning about uh, more research has to be done and to, to, to attract the trust of the governments okay. because it's inevitable that, um, you know, okay. the world is going towards that. I just need to ask one very brief question then to Thibaut Schreppel in Amsterdam. What do you say to the sceptics like um, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk? Elon Musk was singing the praises of Bitcoin just a few years ago. Now he's pulling back a little bit. Sure. And, and then it has been also vocal in, in saying that, you know, maybe it's not too bad after all. And you, you may have some financial interest behind it. So it's very hard to, to read what's happening. But if you move a little bit uh, and you look at the state level, what you see is that there is a tension between trying to keep control and also trying mm. to get lots of users and people involved in the ecosystem, which also provides security. And so that tension is being expressed by the European Central Bank. They have been quite vocal that they are looking for the best way to design the digital euro. But I just want to make it clear that the end game of all that is not just to, to give a cryptocurrency, but it's to own the infrastructure for tomorrow world's transaction. And if a state manages that uh, is a cryptocurrency will be adopted by all the states, it might be the most important economic power ever held by any government because they will control any transactions happening everywhere. 
We shall see what does happen, though. There we have to leave it, I'm afraid. Uh, Thibaut Schreppel in Amsterdam, Delaram Karobai in London and John Biggs in New York. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. You can see all of our previous programmes anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From the Inside Story team and me, Sahil Rahman, thanks very much for your time and your company.